I'm psychology professor Bruce Heinrichs. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the brain, its anatomy and functions, especially from a psychological perspective. Your brain is made up of many different kinds of cells that help communicate messages. So the brain is like a communication system that regulates your body and your mind. The cells in the brain are divided into two different types, neurons and glial cells. The neurons are the main cells that do the communicating. They do this using electrical signals and chemical signals. The human brain is the most complex of all organs. It evolved over millions of years of evolution. A study of the parts of the brain is called neuroanatomy, and the functions are called physiology, although the science of the functions is called neuroscience. If we look at the psychological functions, that would be called psychological neuroscience. Brains develop about after the third week of a pregnancy and develop very, very fast prenatally. And even after birth, by age six, a brain has reached about 90% of its adult size. Uh, brains continue to add neurons at a very, very fast rate and then go through a pruning period in which it the number of neurons is decreased and the number of connections is decreased. But even in adulthood, uh, brains continue to add neurons to brain cells uh, at a rate, a very rapid rate. Uh, this is called neurogenesis. The top part of the brain, which is very large and wrinkled in humans, is called the cerebrum. And the outer layer of the cerebrum, which we see here in this illustration, is called the cortex. The cerebrum is divided into a left side and right side that are called hemispheres. The cerebrum is very large in humans compared to other animals, although as you can see here, a chimpanzee has a cerebral cortex that is somewhat similar to a human's. It has a lot of wrinkles on it. And then as we go down the uh, different animals, we see, for example, the fish or uh, a snake has a very small cerebrum. Uh, a bird has a small cerebrum, but a bird is very smart. So we can't always tell by the size of the cerebrum how smart the animal is. The cerebrum can change with experience, and you can even see this in the anatomy of the brain. Uh, for example, uh, cab drivers in London who have uh, studied for two years to learn a map of the city, have a larger area in their hippocampus, a part of the brain that, that stores our sort of GPS system uh, than other people. So this is called brain plasticity or neuroplasticity. This idea of plasticity is the idea that your brain can, can rewire itself, it can change with experience. The younger you are, the more plasticity you have. Plasticity can be seen in the wiring diagram of the brain. This is called the connectome, the brain's connectome, the whole 3D wiring diagram of all the cells in the brain and all the connections. The cerebrum is divided into four areas called lobes. Lobe just means an area or a section. So we have the frontal lobe and the front part of the brain, the parietal lobe in the back upper part of the brain, the occipital lobe in the lower back, and the temporal lobe on the side uh, by your ears. It turns out that certain places in the cerebral cortex have certain jobs. This is called localization of function. It means that certain locations, certain locales have certain functions. And this can be discovered in, in many different ways. One of them is fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which shows us the activity going on in the brain when a person is doing something. This illustration shows some localization of function in the cerebral cortex. We see the motor cortex that moves your body around, the somatosensory cortex, which receives signals from your body for things like touch and pain. Uh, we have the occipital lobe, which is the primary visual area in the brain. We have an auditory area in the temporal lobe. 
And we have two language areas, Broca's area and Wernicke's area, which are usually on the left hemisphere in most people. Here we're looking at a cross section of a human brain. And we see at the top, the big wrinkly part, the cerebrum, kind of the thinking brain. And then below it is the corpus callosum, which is this band of fibers that connects the left and right hemispheres. So whatever is going on in the left hemisphere can be sent over to the right hemisphere and vice versa. Below that, we have a central area called the thalamus. The thalamus is a relay center. So in, incoming information from your eyes and your ears and your body gets relayed to various places in the brain via the thalamus. So it's like an airport hub. And below the thalamus is the hypothalamus, which literally means below the thalamus, which is an important regulating part of the brain for regulating motivation like hunger and thirst and sex. And below that is the brain stem, which is the very top of the spinal cord, which uh, is very important for keeping you alive and paying attention to things in your environment. And behind the brain stem is the cerebellum, which has a lot of jobs, but the main job that has been studied in the cerebellum is uh, to coordinate your movements of your body. So when you learn a certain body movement, like riding a bike or typing or kicking a ball, that that motor movement, what some people call muscle memory, is stored as a memory in the cerebellum so that your cerebellum can then repeat that action without thinking. This illustration reminds us that even though we talk about different parts of the brain and their functions, they're actually all working together as one big system. So there's many, many communications going on, trillions and trillions of communications going on between the different parts of the brain. The cells of the brain that are doing the processing are called gray matter because they are literally gray in color. But the connecting fibers are coated with a white fatty substance called myelin that helps insulate uh, those uh, what are called axons, those fibers that connect one place in the brain with another. So the connecting parts of the brain we call white matter. Below the cerebrum, there are many different brain parts that work together. And when parts of the brain work together, we call that a system. This one is called the limbic system. And these are a bunch of brain parts that work together that do sort of uh, unconscious, automatic, instinctual responses involving motivation and emotions and dealing with danger like a fight or flight response and so on. This is the limbic system. Here we see another illustration of the location of the limbic system is below the cerebrum. Uh, and above the brain stem, we have these many different parts that are working together, a fight or flight response and emotional responses and instinctual responses, and fast responses to danger, for example. Uh, this is the limbic system. I will mention just a few important parts of the limbic system. First, we have the thalamus, which I mentioned before is a relay center in the brain. So all incoming information goes to the thalamus and then gets sorted out or routed to different parts of the brain. Surrounding the thalamus, we have the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are very important for coordinating and controlling your muscle movements so that your muscles are smooth, your movements, your body will be smooth. When you have damage in the basal ganglia, you end up with uh, problems like dystonia or Parkinson's disease or Tourette's syndrome in which your muscles will jerk. You have jerky, uncontrolled jerky motions of your body. Uh, below the thalamus is the hypothalamus I mentioned before, an important regulating uh, part of the brain for regulating your body for motivations like hunger and thirst and sex. And then also surrounding the thalamus is the hippocampus important for learning and memory. And at the tip of the hippocampus, the amygdala, which is an emotional area that's important for learned emotions and for recognizing emotions on the faces of people. So let us just concentrate on the hippocampus and the amygdala for a minute. The hippocampus uh, actually exists on both sides of the thalamus. So we have a left hippocampus and a right hippocampus. They are known collectively as the hippocampi. 
So uh, the hippocampus is very important uh, for learning and memory, and people who have damage to the hippocampus have what is called anterograde amnesia. They have difficulty creating new memories. And at the tip of the hippocampus, we have the amygdala. And again, there's a left amygdala and right amygdala. So we say amygdalae. We have two amygdalae. And the amygdala is very important for emotions, especially it's been studied uh, as a fear center. So when you learn a new fear, a dog bites you, you become afraid of dogs. But that memory of having that feeling of fear is stored in the amygdala. People born with no amygdala uh, are called people with no fears. Here we see the location of the hippocampi, left hippocampus, right hippocampus, uh, which have been found to be uh, terribly important uh, for learning and memory. And so uh, when you uh, look at some other videos about the hippocampus, you will learn more about this very fascinating field of memory, which has just exploded since uh, scientists discovered the importance of the hippocampus. It has really revolutionized our study of memory. Here we see the location of the amygdala, left amygdala, right amygdala, uh, which is very important for learned fears, emotional responses, uh, threats, uh, danger. Uh, and also the amygdala is important uh, for recognizing emotions on people's faces. So when you look at someone's face, you can tell if they're happy or sad or angry, uh, whether they might be friend or foe. Yes, amygdala is important for helping us recognize emotions on faces. So look at these faces and see if you can tell uh, what emotions are being uh, expressed. And in fact, this has been found to be uh, true all around the world in many, many different cultures with very few exceptions. Uh, so emotions are linked to the amygdala. Let's try it just for fun. Look at these six faces and figure out which one is happy, which one is sad, which one is showing anger, which one shows fear, which one shows surprise, and which one shows disgust? I'm disgusted with that ick. So look at these faces and figure out which one's happy, one is sad, one is angry, one is fear, one is surprise, one is disgust. Have you got it? Here are the answers. Did you get them all right? Is your amygdala working correctly? Next, let's look at some images of a real human brain. And here are a few more illustrations of a real human brain, including on the lower left, you can clearly see the left and right hemispheres and the longitudinal fissure that divides them. Scientists today have very high tech equipment that can scan the human brain and show us these amazing images. In this illustration, we get a reminder of the four lobes of the cerebrum, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe, and then down underneath the cerebrum, the brainstem and the cerebellum. And finally, a reminder of many of the parts of the brain that were discussed and described in this video. That brings us to the end of our video on brain. And boy, I hope you learned a lot and enjoyed it. Isn't it amazing stuff? See you later, bye.